teachers, educators, parents and friends to the second episode of Best Practices in English as a Second Language Instruction. Today, we will continue our discussion on best practice by examining the practices of two primary school teachers and by looking at some methodological issues in terms of ESL instruction. I am Kuldeep Kaur, a teacher educator at the University of Malaya and I have with me today Azlina who is a, an experienced practitioner in the field of ESL. Azlina, would you like to brief the audience on some of the topics that we are going to discuss today? Thank you Kuldeep. Uh, today we are going to be looking at how teachers can use teaching aids in the classroom. We will talk about the different aids that are commonly used and the way in which teachers can enliven their class sessions with the use of materials that supplement the text. We will also look at the use of the inductive approach in the teaching of grammar and the use of mind maps or webs for vocabulary expansion. Finally, we will examine the structure of a lesson in terms of the progression from words to senses, and then to paragraphs. Thank you, Azlina. An important aspect of best practice is the use of teaching aids or supplementary materials to support learning and thinking. The use of teaching aids in classrooms is important for various reasons. For one thing, the teaching aids support the learning outcome by providing visual and oral cues uh, for understanding of content. Secondly, teachers often use teaching aids as a way of providing variety and richer in options in input. Thus, if students receive input from the textbook on day one, they can then receive input in the form of audio-based or video-based uh, materials on day two. Thirdly, teachers are able to tailor the use of supplementary materials to cater to the needs of their students. Thus, a teacher can choose the most appropriate materials for the different levels of proficiency of her students. Let us begin by talking about the different teaching aids that two teachers use in their classroom. We will visit today Mr. Chu from the SJKC Walian in Sepang and Ms. Pritam Ko from the SJKT in Kaja. the classroom practices of these two teachers? Let us now look at Ms. Pritam's class. She is conducting a lesson on clothing and in a moment you will see that she has brought various forms of attire to class. Let us see how this form of teaching aid is used in her class. Do you know what clothing are? Can you name me one? Any of you? Prima? Okay, very good. Now, Prasad, what do you wear at your school? I wear a school uniform. Very good, you can sit down. Next. Uh, Abu? What do you wear when you go to the temple? I wear a kutta to the temple. Okay, good. Can you hear that? Okay, next. Kavindra, what do you wear when you go for games? I wear, I wear a t-shirt and a shirt. Very good. Sit down. Alright. Can you look at the clothing here? Now, these clothing are worn by people in Malaysia. Can you name me one? Yes. Okay, Michael Rao. 
Okay, where is it? Bajukuram, can you show me? Okay, good. Okay, go back to your place. Next, anyone else? Mangalam? Sampu. Can you come up, please? And show me the sampu. Good. This is a sampu. Okay, you can go back. Next one. Megan Adam. Baju Melayu. Where is it? Okay, good. You can go back to your place. Next. What do you call this again? What do you call this? What do you call this? What about this? Punjabi soup. Okay. There is another name for Punjabi soup. Can anyone tell me the name of this soup? You? Louder please? Yes. Good. It's correct. You can sit down. Okay. That was interesting, wasn't it? Don't you think the use of Vela in the classroom makes a refreshing change? Yes, it does. And you can see that the students can quickly relate what they are learning in class to the, the items that the teacher has brought to the classroom. Um, what I must also say is that these items that the teacher has brought are sourced from the social cultural world of the students. And this is one way of bringing the students' life worlds into the classroom. Another way in which the teacher has encouraged the use of new vocabulary is with the use of pictures. You will see in a moment how Miss Pritam encourages her students to identify, read and spell new terms with the use of a chart. Let us look at this segment on the screen now. Can you spell the word? Scarf. S-K-A-R-F. Scarf. S-K-A-R-F is wrong. Anyone can help her? Dinesh? S-C-E-R-F. Scarf. S-E-A-R-F. Wrong. Framela? Scarf. S-C-A-R-F. Scarf. Very good. Please give a clap. Alright. All of you spell this word again. Again. Alright, the next word. Okay, move a turn. Can you name this? What is this? Boots. Can you spell the word? B O O T S boots. Can all of you spell the word? B O O T S boots. Okay, very good. Now. Okay. You will notice that Miss Pritam involves the students in various ways. She points to the specific item on the chart, asks a student to identify it, and then gets the students to say it aloud and to spell the word. And in this way. Miss Pritam reinforces the new vocabulary in terms of its sound and spelling. What do you think of it? I noticed that she moved from the familiar to the unfamiliar. Uh, for example, she first focused on the women's costumes, uh, especially costumes that Malaysian women wear. And then she moved on to the uh, you know, items such as the scarf and the boots. Uh, which are probably less commonly worn by Malaysians. We will now move on to another teacher's classroom. Uh, let us look at how Mr. Chu uses teaching aids to enhance his students' learning. 
and understanding of new terms that he introduces in his class. Essentially, Mr. Use, Mr. Chu uses an overhead projector mm -hmm. and he has lots of pictures which he uses to stimulate the, his students' interest on various occupations that he wishes to introduce in the class. The pictures are useful in helping students see the context within which uh, a term is used and uh, where the occupation is performed. Uh, you will notice, for example, that when introducing the carpenter, Mr. Mr. Chu has a picture of a workstation where a carpenter uses various tools like a saw, for example. And then the carpenter is using these tools and working with his hands. Uh, these are all the visual cues that are useful in getting the students to view the situation mm -hmm. and at the same time enrich their knowledge about the concept. Uh, let us look at this part of Mr. Chu's lesson on the screen. Yeah. Occupation. Now, let me show you some of the common occupations. You might see it every day. Look at the screen. Carpenter. Carpenter. A carpenter does all the woodwork. He makes furniture, such as desk, chairs, bed, cupboard, etc. A gardener. A gardener. A gardener grows flowers. He takes care of flowers and he waters the flowers every day. A tailor. 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 A tailor makes our clothes. This is a very interesting occupation. I think most of you like it also. What is this word? A pilot. A pilot drives an aeroplane. He takes passengers around the world. Who is he? What does a postman do? He delivers letters. Okay? Delivers letters. So you see? Pilot. What does he do? Flies an aeroplane. Okay, a pilot flies an aeroplane. Okay, here are some of the uh, occupations that we see we have seen in books, in pictures, or in movies, or in other places. Okay, as you have just seen, Mr. Chu reiterates the new terms on occupations with the use of word cards. He has written each term on a card and as he shows them the card, the students say the word aloud. In this way, the students see the word, note its spelling and simultaneously hear it being said. All of these procedures help learners internalize the concept better. A second theme that is related to best practice is the teacher's ability to vary the techniques during a single lesson. Informed practitioners are able to move between different techniques, approaches and strategies naturally and systematically. They do this not for the sake of change, but to enhance thinking and learning. In the following segment, you will see how Ms. Fricka uses the inductive approach in teaching a grammatical item. In this instance, the teacher first provides a list of examples that use a verb and then she elicits from the students and she asks the students to identify the patterns in the various examples that she provides. This is different 
from other ways of providing form-focused instruction, where a teacher gives a rule and then she elicits examples from the students. Let us see how Ms. Pritam uses the inductive approach in her class. Work. Okay? He likes. She likes. The girl likes. We we what do you have when it's a negative statement? Can you see any difference there? What is the difference? Negative statements have or not? Negative statements, they have a not. Negative statements, they have a not. Do not. I do not like. You do not like. We do not like. They do not like. And the boys do not like. Okay, he and she. He and she. What is the word here? Does not like. He does not like. She, she does not like. The boy does not like. Taiwan does not like. Okay, you can sit down, Prasan. Okay, the inductive approach is useful in getting the students to think about underlying assumptions, commonalities, and general rules underlying a circle of ideas. In the segment you have just seen, Miss Pritam gets her students to think about the common features related to positive and negative senses. She encourages them to think of one general rule that applies to the set of examples she has provided. Therefore, the inductive approach is useful in enhancing thinking skills. Let us now look at how another teacher uses the inductive approach in his classroom. In a few moments, you will see Mr. Chu with his students. He uses the sun ray technique when brainstorming around the occupations he presents to his students. This technique is useful in reviewing words that students already know and can be used for sentence expansion as well as the development of paragraphs. However, instead of merely having students think of words in association with an occupation, Mr. Chu encourages them to provide the occupation and hence the rule that governs a circle of ideas. Let us see how this is done in Mr. Chu's class. What is this? Okay, come on, what is this? What is, what is this? Design? 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 Then? So, what can you put there? Postman. So you can put the word postman there. Here. Okay, now I'm going to give you a, give you a worksheet here. Uh, do, as, do as I do. Uh, do as I do. So and see whether you can do it. Uh, do it, do it, watch it. Two to a rope. Two to a rope. Okay, we should use here. One, two, three, four, five. Two to a rope. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, Monica, come. We should do two to a two person share one paper. Okay? Two pencils, share one pencil. I give you two minutes to finish it. Two minutes. Two minutes. So the first one I've done for you. The first one I've done for you. Okay. The second one, and third one, and fourth one. See whether you can do it or not. Okay, you can discuss with your friends. Okay, you can discuss with your friends.
What is this word first? Look at the first word, the associate word, see the first. Measuring tape. This one? So, this one? And then? Okay. Who uses this? A carpenter. A carpenter, okay? Spell, say the word carpenter, how to write the word carpenter? Very good. And see the next one. Next one. What is this word? Fire engine. Okay, fire engine. Say so siren. You know what siren? Can you make the sound siren sound? This is a sound of siren. Okay, then? What is this man? Very good, fireman. So the next one? Health doctor. Syringe, hospital, patient, medicine. So what is what is he or what is she? Nurse. Okay, it's a nurse. Very good. So any question? There are two points I would like to raise in relation to what we have just seen. The first point is related to the notion of collaboration in the classroom. You would have noticed that Mr. Chu first collaborates with his students in trying to identify the occupations uh, that are related to a circle of ideas. Secondly, you will notice that Mr. Chu encourages his students to work with their peers in order that they work together on that and complete the workshop that he has given them. With regard to this, Azlina would like to put in a few points in relation to collaborative work in the classroom. As you can see, when the teacher asks the students to either work in pairs or groups of three or four, there will be some kind of positive interaction going on. But teachers must remember that groups shouldn't be too big. Four should be the maximum number as if there are many students in a group, they will tend to engage in other activities than the tasks that they're supposed to do. Thank you, Azlina. The second point I would like to raise with regard to what you have just seen in Mr. Chu's class is about constant and effective feedback. What happens in classrooms is that students work on their own or with their peers and they, they may not be able to find out answers or they may not be able to know for themselves whether they have done what is required of them. Thus, self-evaluation is not something that can happen in every classroom all the time. Thus, what we need is, as we saw in Mr. Chu's class, constant feedback and instant feedback. Opportunities for feedback have to be provided and if they are provided instantly, then students are able to relate what they have just learned to what uh, the, the uh, teacher is trying to contact with them quickly and efficiently. Finally, we will now go to Ms. Pritham's class to look at how she engages her students in group work and gets them to participate in an inductive manner on two tasks that she has assigned. In a few moments, you will see on your screens how Ms. Pritham gets her students to piece together pieces of a puzzle in order to form a picture that tells a story. She then has her students put together a whole list of sentence strips in order to make a paragraph that tell the story of the picture. Let us go to Miss Pritam's class now and see how she encourages her students to collaboratively work on this story.
So now I want you to come out here and present your your jigsaw puzzle with the silent scripts. People in Malaysia wear different kinds of clothes. During festivals, they wear traditional clothes. The Malays, for example, wear baju melayu and baju kurung. The Chinese women wear tongsam or sampo. The Indian women wear sari or salwar kameez. On other days, people in Malaysia dress in casual clothes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have just witnessed how two teachers use the joint principles of dress practice in their own classrooms. We have just witnessed how teachers look at classrooms by way of uh, encouraging peer collaboration, teacher-student collaboration, the inductive approach, as well as the effective use of teaching aids and supplementary materials in the ESL classroom. With that, we conclude our second episode of Best Practices in the English as a Second Language Classroom and we hope you will join us for our next episode on the same topic. Thank you.